All right. Welcome. Welcome. Hello. Hope everybody have, is having a good afternoon. Um, welcome to the Africa Meetup here, hosted by GitHub. Uh, I'm super excited about the guests that we have today and the lineup we have as well. Um, virtual events are always challenging. And um, uh, I want to put together, actually, I want to actually say a couple words before we get started. So, so here we go. So GitHub always wants to make Meetup safe and celebratory for everyone and an escape to the wild, wider world that allows us to uh, get to know each other. Um, but in our Meetup for African developers this month, we want to make sure that we start with the acknowledgement that what is affecting our developers in Nigeria since our last meetup. So uh, we've heard a lot of concerning stories of pre police brutality um, from SARS, the SARS branch of Nigeria police force. And I just want to let you know that GitHub stands firmly with our Nigerian friends and our developers everywhere. Uh, and yeah, and uh, we, we are hosting this event specifically for you and for you to be able to amplify your voices and showcase the work that you are doing in your communities. So uh, thank you for that. And I just wanted to just make that acknowledgement up front. Um, so let's just jump into the event. Um, this is a remote event. If you are here in the chat, uh, feel free to type uh, NG. Uh, we'll use that as our, our either that the, you could use the clapping emoji as well if you uh, know how to do that as well. So give us a hello if you're here, if you're listening, if you're well. Thank you very much. Excellent. So I'm Brian Douglas, and um, this is our Africa Meetup. Uh, this is the first time I'm, I'm hosting. This is our second time doing it as well. And I'm super happy to have the opportunity to hear from so many great speakers uh, and get to know all you folks as well. So uh, if you are using uh, GitHub, feel free to drop your, your GitHub name as well. Uh, I know uh, we have our real names here on, on YouTube. Uh, um, as I mentioned, I'm Ducky as well. and. What I want to do is I want to jump into some content that I had prepared uh, specifically around GitHub Actions to sort of high level so that way you get a chance to get to know me and get to know the work that I do here at GitHub. So uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to share my screen and go into present mode. And there we go. All right. So yeah, this this um, really quickly, this uh, this talk I'm going to give is around GitHub Action, Get Action Traction, uh, specifically around GitHub Actions. It's something I've been spending a lot of time uh, in my day job uh, doing. And um, if you don't know, uh, I like to call myself the Beyonce uh, of GitHub. Uh, this is, it sounds like a lot of hubris, but I have a lot of respect for Beyonce because Beyonce, she's a world renowned superstar. Uh, I had the opportunity of opening up for Beyonce um, in China. Uh, technically, I did it. I spoke in uh, three cities away from Shanghai after she spoke or she played. Uh, seven weeks later. So I didn't get to actually open up for her, but I did speak in China around the same time that she was there, um, sort of, give or take a month or two. Uh, what, I, what I'm getting at is Beyonce, she has a very large following and worldwide, So, which I mentioned Beyonce because she's, she's well known. And I hope to get to that point eventually. Uh, but here at GitHub, I'm a developer advocate at GitHub. Brian Douglas sets me on Twitter. This is me on GitHub. I'm Dougie on GitHub. And I, I actually go by Dougie as well. Um, so feel free to call me either or uh, I'll respond to both. And uh, what I do is I, I, I legitimately, I go to bat for the hive. So if you have questions about GitHub, if you're looking to speak at this meetup, uh, feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to intro you to, to folks who organize this uh, and get you connected. Uh, I will shout out to you as well. GitHub Universe is happening in a couple months. So definitely check that out. Uh, and I'm happy to answer questions about that. But Two years ago at GitHub Universe, we launched this feature called GitHub Actions. And GitHub Actions is, if you are, if you're, if you're familiar with GitHub Actions, just give us a wave and say yes or no in the chat. Uh, but GitHub Actions, it's a, a really powerful feature. Uh, and what it really does, it integrates and hooks into our GitHub API. Uh, it provides a better integration experience uh, for folks who just want to do things like automating your workflow, uh, which I know our, our next speaker will actually go into detail about as well. Uh, but what we've done, we take these primitives like authentication, primitives like webhooks, and primitives like the, the API itself. And we've sort of co-located that directly inside your repos to give you the ability to do some really cool things. Um, so if you have not checked, about, checked out GitHub Actions, definitely check out our Actions um, landing page. Uh, we provide more detail and examples um, where you can sort of dig deep into that. Um, but if you sort of like zoom out and talk about this, 
what Actions does really well, it, it provides a sort of a hook into your software development life cycle, uh, where you have these repetitive tasks that you do all the time. Uh, one of my repetitive tasks during Hacktoberfest was actually reviewing PRs. And the way I, I manage reviewing PRs is I would get a someone coming through with a PR. And the first thing I do, if you're the first person or first time you've actually contributed to the project, you get a welcome message that's powered by an action. And the, what I do with this welcome message is I actually power this, this action to point you directly to the Discord. Uh, because what I want is I want folks to have a great experience the first time they sort of are introduced to the project I maintain. So with that being said, uh, I give them a welcome message. I thank them very much for their, their contribution. And then I try to get them to talk to me in the Discord. Uh, and that's really the focus there because I want them to have an interaction with me. I want them to have a face to the project and not feel like they're just sort of opening PRs to avoid of hoping that the main maintainer will accept this PR. So that's what I use with GitHub Actions. That's one, one use case. Uh, and I use this use case, and I use this analogy too as well. Uh, so uh, I imagine a lot of us are familiar with basketball, but I, I come from the, the, the experience of uh, Stan Lee, who's the creator of Marvel co Comics. Uh, he has this quote called, imagine every issue is your first issue. Or imagine every issue is the reader's first issue. So... If you don't know about basketball, I'm about to explain some basketball concepts to you. Um, apologies, you already know this, but look, this is for the benefit of everybody in the room. Um, so this is a basketball court. Uh, if you know football or soccer, uh, basketball is basically very similar, except uh, instead of dribbling with your feet, you dribble with your hands. Uh, and the object is to get the ball in the opposing team's hoop. Uh, so I have a basketball that I have on the screen that's going directly into the hoop. Um, this is the concept that we call and uh, that was very popular in the, in the mid 2000s called full court layups. Uh, Alan Iverson is one person who might might be familiar with folks. Um, I'm a bit older than some people, so I've been watching basketball for a long time and uh, well, for a while. And so the idea of full court layups, when you have five people on a team, you, the, the object is to leverage your entire team to score the points. But there was like this phenomenon where only one player would do all the work and the rest of the players would be de decoys. Uh, and that's okay. Like if you're uh, the solo developer on a team or you work for an agency and you're doing all the work, I think that's fine. But when you want to really get that sort of 10x developer experience, the 10x actually, it's actually leveraging the entire team uh, and not just yourself. Um, so, and maybe that's just my perception of what that should mean. But what I'm getting at is with full court layups, you probably don't want to do that. You don't want to be the only one shipping code. You don't want to be the only one that has the keys to merge PRs. Um, so in the concept of basketball, uh, we have another sport called baseball. And there's this book, popular book called Moneyball, uh, which really took statistics and improved the game of baseball. And they took that same concept to the NBA. So they took statistics, applied to the NBA, and then they found out that there's one point in the basketball court where you have the highest percentage of making the shot and having it go in. And they call this area 31. And I, I am going to bring this to a point and this will make sense eventually. So bear with me. But area 31 is the point where it's so cl it's close to the, to the net or to the hoop itself that the way you shoot it with the arc, it's, it's very difficult to defend against. Um, so what happens is most teams, they, they over index and they optimize their plays to get the ball to that point of the hoop or uh, the, the point of the court to make the, the actual, uh, the, the point <laughs> go in. Um, so what I'm getting at is there are certain things that you're doing uh, in your code base, certain things in your developer workflow and your the, the workflow lifecycle that you can over, you can actually automate and optimize inside of your workflow. So I mentioned PRs as a place that I know I'm going to get PRs because my project tends to be very inviting. It's a React project that's built on GraphQL. And I, I want to make sure that people, if they find interest in changing something small, they're interested enough to connect with me to change something bigger eventually. And that your first contribution is not hopefully not going to be your last contribution to my project. So that's what I do. And that's what I've indexed for. And I know that some of the good fish issues that I put out there for folks to actually contribute, they're literally the area 31. It's the, it's the thing I know that if you contribute to this, like you will stick with me and you will become one of my, my main contributors for my project. So shout out to my GitHub uh, portfolio and uh, definitely take a look at that and let me know if you want to contribute. And I mentioned this earlier too, is around, um, I tend to review pull requests once a day. I actually have a, a time block every uh, every day where I sit and review my pull requests that are on my projects to make sure that I'm still in, engaging with the community despite how busy I am or 
um, how much time I do have. I make sure I have I set that time aside. Uh, one thing that I want to mention too, in like a more concrete example, is GitHub Actions with GitHub Script, which is a really cool tool to be able to write actions in JavaScript. So earlier this year, we shipped this, this hackathon, which was called GitHubHackathon.com. Um, the way we submitted, we, we took submissions for the hackathon itself was through a GitHub repo. So this entire website was powered by one GitHub repo, which is, it sounds pretty obvious, um, but um, what I'm getting at is that these submissions were also pull requests onto the same repo that was powering the view site that we, were, we had power. And we did this through this open source re uh, repository and tool called GitHub Script. And it literally looks like this. So this is five lines of JavaScript. Everything above the yellow is actually YAML. Um, but I was able to write uh, JavaScript to take a, uh, every time an issue was labeled, I was able to merge a peer, uh, pull request. Um, so what you just saw on the screen was our featured um, actions page. And what I would do is I would just take a label and label the PR. And then if it was meant to be featured, it would go directly to the home page. If it wasn't, then it would just basically just be merged in and folks would get a notification saying that their their PR was merged. So this is what I'm doing. And this is, again, this is part of that automation, the Area 31. Like I know I'm going to get PRs. I know I'm going to have to either merge them or, or, or close them. And at this point, the other thing I didn't mention is that we were leveraging actions to validate the actions that were submitted. So once you've opened the PR, we actually have validation that actually kicks off as well, which is like a whole nother uh, story, which I'll go way more in detail at GitHub Universe. So definitely shout out to GitHub Universe. Check it out. Uh, it will be actually be on this YouTube slash Twitch. Um, so just make sure you hit the follow button, hit the subscribe button, so that way you get notified when I'm ready to speak <laughs> at GitHub Universe. <laughs> All right. So and then, as I mentioned before, this is the featured page as well. So I bring this up because this was a way for me to automate. We were able to take this entire project to our, we have 50 million developers worldwide. We didn't have that many people submitting actions, but I was able to accomplish this with two of my other teammates. And all we had to do was just label issues or label pull requests and move forward through the, um, the process of getting people their swag and stickers. Um, shout out also on YouTube. I do a YouTube series called Get Action Traction, which is the name of this, this talk. Um, definitely find me over there. Um, you can find me by go typing in I like robot or B Dougie. Both of them work. There's a whole other story about I like robot, but you'll have to ask me later. Um, and with that being said, that's my information. And I thank you very much for listening to me talk about actions. One of the, one of my favorite things to talk about. So without further ado, we're going to transition into our first speaker, uh, who I will call IO IO, um, being a nickname with your last name. Thank you very much for showing up and providing this talk. Io is a develop, uh, senior developer advocate and also a GitHub star, as well as a media uh, developer expert as well for Cloudinary. So um, Io makes <laughs> uh, definitely an expert in a lot of different areas, but I'm looking forward to hearing what you're talking about GitHub action. So Io, please take it away. Yeah, so thank you, Brian. I'm excited to be here. This is an exciting conference, and I'm happy GitHub is doing this. And also, thank you, Brian, for talking about the NSAS movement we are working on here in Nigeria. Um, it's been a lot going on here in Nigeria, and we need as much support as we can get. And we're happy that GitHub stands with us and the developers in the country. So yeah, um, without further ado, let's get into the talk. So my slides. Awesome. So um, today, I'm gonna be talking about how to automate workflow processes using GitHub Actions. So um, Barian did a whole lot of talk about basically what GitHub Actions is. And GitHub Actions was released in November 13th, a couple of years ago. So um, basically, uh, yeah, let's, get, let's just get right into the talk so you get to see what all this is about. And yeah, um, okay, yeah, some animations. <laughs> so um, I am Shodipa Yamide, a senior developer advocate and developer programs manager, also a GitHub star, Cloud9 media developer expert, and I love to refer to myself as a community evangelist based on I love doing community work. I love working with the community at large, planning conferences and small meetups across different locations and really a whole bunch of work that has to be working with the community at large. So yeah, you can find me on Twitter and GitHub at developer.io, that's developer, then AO, AYO, um, Twitter, GitHub, and follow me there and you can get to see what I tweet about. I tweet a lot there and I have products on GitHub you could contribute to or um, yeah. So let's move forward. Ha, I like that. 
<laughs> so yeah, let's talk about workflow automation. So GitHub Actions allows you to write or set up individual um, actions and combine them to make a complete workflow automation. So we need to really um, basically what GitHub asks you. Okay, you're gonna write a small action saying this action basically is gonna help um, review this pull request. So once it's open, it's gonna add this label. It's gonna automatically assign this person to this pull request. It's gonna do all of this. This is an action. And that is one action that does this. Then another action that does probably once it has been um or progress has been made, automatically deploys to Firebase, automatically deploys to Azure using using um a GitHub actions that were developed by these companies who owns these products. So we have all of these actions put together. So when we automate processes like this, that automatically can be called a GitHub actions workflow. Yeah, basically automating a whole bunch of workflows that um yeah you can just automate and you don't need to really concern yourself with um, manually doing them yourself and it's exciting that github was able to release this kind of feature that will make things easier for um people who are moderating open source projects and um yeah working on them so workflow automation literally is this so we have um, the first responders things we have like these are all actions that so when this happens this happens this happens are all actions so when you put all this together, you call them a workflow because they all run different assignments. They all run different things. This one auto assign, this auto assign means so once this request has been made, automatically it automatically assigns the pull requests um, being opened to or issue being opened to um, someone on the team who is a maintainer. That's an action that can be configured. Um, when issues are being created, what should happen next? Um, when pull requests are being made, what should happen next? If the, if the build test is passed, what exactly should be merged immediately? Or should someone be notified immediately? What should happen? So this, um, these are actions and these are workflows we can put together and we can automate a whole bunch of things in our open source projects. Trust me, you would want to automate almost everything in your project just to, you're gonna, it's gonna relieve you of so much headache that comes with um, like really large open source projects. During the Hacktober first program, um, there were a lot of things that went around with people um, making some kind of weird contributions, but GitHub was able to come up front and um, create one, create a, create a fix that will help um, certain people to start, don't create pull requests. If they want to spam, create spam pull requests. And that was really fast and that was really amazing. So um, when, when you're running like a really large open source product, this feature alone um, will help you automate a whole bunch of things. And yeah, one of the best ways to increase productivity while working on those open source project is to automate everything. So literally everything in your open source project can be automated. Um, thanks to really GitHub Actions, they, it has really changed so much in open source project and how open source um, uh, maintainers really uh, moderate their projects because a whole bunch of issues like lot projects like React JS is a really large project, VJS, um, Firebase, and all of these tools out there that we use constantly that are always receiving pull requests and issues. Um, and we cannot really look at everything. We have like a six man team and like a really huge open source project used by, um, let's say, um, three million people worldwide that's a lot that's a lot of people and a lot of them are developers who want to um create pull requests to fix other things so automating most of the process that has to be pull requests would be literally increased productivity and i'm happy that github has this feature so let's move forward so every event um that happens in your repo can trigger an automated action so every single event you can phantom you can think about it's possible to create and automatically trigger um a github action so when a prayer is being pushed an action can come up when um, an issue is opened an action can do something when a new branch is created an action can do something when anything is created at all an action can always do something when things are automatically pushed to github um to a github repo automatic deployment is possible and more, a whole bunch of things you can put out there. You can create your, your own actions. You can also use actions that were created by other people by the, in the community. So literally, you can automate almost everything in your open source projects. Isn't that amazing? That's super amazing. I love doing this. And if anything, I could automate anything, I would definitely automate that. So as developers, one major thing is when we have problems that we have, for example, um, I'm not so great with colors. So I'm saying, hey, um, I'm really bad at picking colors when I'm working on projects, when I'm designing, I'm really bad at colors. But then um, I can just get an image saying, I want to get all the colors in this image and just get them and use whichever one I want. So I created Image Hive. So all I basically, Image Hive basically helps you pick colors from um, images that you have. So I just got there, it gives me the hex code and the RGB code, then I can use them in whichever project I'm working on design or web-based projects. So when you have a problem, um, yeah, just create a solution and GitHub Actions is a solution to many of our problems that has to do with, um, yeah, automation. So you can also consider GitHub Actions as um, this reusable piece of code um, 
that so for example we can think about like an npm like like npm js package manager so where you can um create reusable libraries and packages you can push over there and people can really um pull and reuse in your project rather than writing things on scratch for example let's talk about something as simple as um, let's say react share so react share is a package over npm um that basically helps you implement share buttons facebook share twitter share and all of these share buttons into your project and clicking this button sends it somewhere. Instead of you writing all of this from the beginning, you can just use this package. So instead of you writing actions from the beginning, you can just really use this. So there's an action GitHub Actions Marketplace where you can visit and use actions that has been created by other people and you can modify to however you want it to work for you. As simple as that, yeah. So you can also call it a GitHub Actions Manager. So <laughs> whatever you want to call it, you can also call it a GitHub Actions Manager. Um, that's what that's what I'm going to call it. <laughs> Let's move forward. So um, you can, as I said before, you can create um, new actions. You can also use already created actions that were built by the community. Um, so yeah, you can set up a new workflow yourself or you can use what um, has been created already by the community. So um, now, GitHub actions, um, you, do, they are not, you don't just like create a repo, then create a file um, actions or YAML or main or YAML or anything of YAML. It doesn't work that way. There is a directory where the YAML file for the actions workflow, that's most where, like where it must be present. So there is a dot file called dot GitHub. Then in that file, we have the workflow, another folder. Then in that workflow, for, workflow folder is where we have the YAML file that has to do with our GitHub actions. It, now, GitHub Actions will, will not automatically find this YAML file if it's outside this directory because why this is where it's been configured to. So if you want to configure your GitHub Actions, um, automatically when you go back to Actions, create a new workflow as we have right here in the slide. Um, once you click this, it's going to take you to a preview. Um, I'm going to show you later on the slide on how it looks like. Then just create this, this project workflow. You don't have to create this manually. It's automatically being created. I'm going to show you as we move forward. So yeah, it's not like Travis that um, we created Travis.yaml file in our main product, in our roots, in our roots folder, where we see Travis.yaml. No, it has to be inside a product called the GitHub, then the workflow folder. That's where we can have our YAML file. And GitHub Actions can really find that file and um, run the actions that we um, initiated in that main file. So we can have main.yaml, we can have deploy.yaml, we can just name it whatever we want based on um, the kind of actions we are running in that file. So yeah, so once you're creating a workflow, it's gonna so automatically, so this is a rep I created, GitHub Africa Actions. So this is a folder then. The next, we have another um, dot file called .github. Then inside .github, we have the workflow. Then we have the file, the GitHub Actions file, that's the main.yaml file, where we have our GitHub configurations. And this is where we write all of our workflow, as simple as that. So once you commit this to your main project, and it's gonna, it's gonna be saved inside this directory, then once you go under the GitHub Actions folder, for that, this automatically is being seen. And once you push a pull request, whatever you write here, say, for example, when a pull request is being opened, it should run these tags. Automatically, that basically happens because why? It finds this file and says, hey, let's let's run this tags. So there's also, as I said before, there are also actions that has already been pre-created by the communities that can be reused. So there are actions that has to do with Go, that has to do with tags, that has to be set up Java SDK, and all of these actions that we can all see here. They are all different actions that we can um, initiate anytime we're working on um, a project. So instead of you like starting an account all the way from the start, um, yeah, you can always use that. Go to the GitHub Actions Market just for security reasons, because there are some actions that um, we just created. Um, and so if you really want to, you're working on a high-end enterprise project, always look out for the number of stars. Very important for security reasons. And also um, the if it's verified. If it's not verified, um, if the actions is not verified, you can also click then see the content of the project as I'm going to show you as we move forward. So again, yes, so this is the GitHub Actions Marketplace. So we have the apps, we have all of these categories where we have different kinds of tools we can integrate into our projects. But there is a path for the GitHub Actions where we have all of these GitHub Actions extension. Um, yeah, GitHub, GitHub Actions rather. So um, we have the deploy tags for Amazon AWS. We have release no previews. We have a whole lot of actions. And as of right now, as when I took this screenshot, we had GitHub has about 5,638 actions available on the GitHub Marketplace, and that's a lot of numbers. And we're having, we're constantly having more people building GitHub Actions, and you should build GitHub Actions too. And yeah, make it open source and support the open source community. So yes, ever, as I said before, for security reasons, um, each actions own their own um, GitHub repository, so you can fork it and customize their GitHub repository however you want. You can customize it however you.
you want click on the repo you can always click on the automatically um see what's present and read through the code basically you can just like um click on readme click on actions or yaml you can click on um the github workflows you can click on src and look at what's inside and before you basically uh, literally use it for anything it's all open source so this is simple github actions and basically what this does is it's going to be verifying pull requests so this is the name of the um github actions so this is a pull request a yaml file that remember is going to be in our directory github workflow directory so gonna verify all pull requests then um basically it's gonna after we find all pull requests it's gonna get a list of um all pull requests um that we have opened on whatever projects for our repo we are working on every pull request and gonna send everything so it's gonna slack it's gonna slack out, get a slack token and basically send all of that pull requests that are open to our slack channel that's really truly and really simple what this github actions does so constantly on a, a kind of basis it gets every pull request that's opened on our rig hub repo and sends all of those open pull requests to a slack channel where we um we're going to configure our actions on the slack channel and so yes, let's talk a bit about our payment. So GitHub is super generous with how GitHub Actions has been commercialized. And um, so for so for public repositories, um, it's free to use GitHub Actions. So um, you have free 2,000 um, so yeah, 2, min, uh, minutes um, per month. On the pro version, we have 3,000 minutes. Um, team version, we have 3,000. Then enterprise, we have 50,000 minutes per month. Then they also have um, runners, that's Linux runner, the Windows runner, Mac OS, and the self-hosted, which is free. Then it's all, all paid, and the Linux version of two cores, two cores um, of seven gigabytes is zero point zero zero eight US dollars. It's not even up to a dollar. So this is really generous of um, um, GitHub doing this, and I'm excited that they really made the price so low, and so everyone can use GitHub Actions and automate processes and basically just make it making open source um, better for everyone and getting more people involved. So GitHub Actions is available for GitHub free tier automatically. So you can start using GitHub Actions starting right now. Um, therefore, GitHub Pro is available, GitHub Team, GitHub Enterprise. Um, GitHub Actions are available for across everyone who uses um, basically GitHub. You have access to GitHub Actions. You can use already made GitHub Actions, or you can also write your own GitHub Actions. So a log, as we all know, is um, how we see the processes being run under the hood. Um, if anything goes wrong, we can always go to the log and find out basically where processes fail. So for GitHub Actions also, there's always a log here. So this is a simple screenshot of basically what a log looks like. So here we have um, the last run, basically what's run last, what did it, was it successful, did it fail? We have this, then we also have this. So when you also, when you, in automatic, when you like for example, let's say push the pull request, this doesn't say tick. This basically shows a round bar saying, it's gonna show yellow if it's still um, processing, it's still trying to load up, um, trying to run the um, GitHub Actions. So this also is a um, workflow, basically the workflow and uh, what basically what jobs are being run. So this, this are basically, so this is just the workflow. Then here is just the jobs are being run. Then right here is the steps that are being run. Um, so yeah, you can so clicking this button helps you download the log and basically how long it takes each job to run it. So it took setting up the job took um, took um, two seconds. Um, so this also took a second. So um, yeah, basically it's as simple as that. This is basically a log. Um, we all know how to read logs um, as long as you're a developer. Um, you should know how to read a log and how all of this works. So then this is basically all the log you can scroll through and see all of these things. So um, the next thing, you can also expand um, the jobs. So once you, for example, once you, initial, so remember what I said before about this tick pass, so is when the actions automatically successfully run, then it shows the tick. If not, it's gonna show you something is failing. So you're gonna see the red, then some passed, so some failed. So as we can see also, go into our log, we can see that three of our jobs passed, but one, one field so clicking this button right here expands the job then we can see the description of how exactly and what exactly failed while this job was running so we can know how exactly to fix this so moving forward we also have the search log so there's sometimes where your jobs are failing at the same time so um you might know exactly what you're looking for so you can also go straight to the search log under the github actions log and search for what in fact what exactly you're looking for and find the error and basically just read it out and fix the solution there's always a search bar there you can search um the logs on so there's also this amazing status badge status badge of honor that i just want to call it so <laughs> So I call the status badge of honor. So for um, the GitHub Actions, so if your GitHub Actions is failed, you can also um, have this on your website um, where you can, so if it's passed, so if your GitHub Actions is passed, you can also have this on your readme file so everyone can see that your GitHub Actions is passing at this time. And if it fails, you can also see that it's failing. So um, yeah, you can also add this to your project. 
so some resources you might need. So the repo I show you where I have that simple GitHub Actions running. Um, if you go to um, github.com forward slash developer, are you forward slash github hyphen Africa hyphen actions, you can get to see that repository. Then if you want to know more about GitHub Actions, just visit github.com forward slash features forward slash actions, and that's the official website for GitHub Actions. So uh, yeah, thank you so much. You can so I'm open to questions, and you can follow me on Twitter and GitHub um, as developer are you. So thanks everyone. Uh, thank you very much. That was uh, super informative too, as well. Um, you you legitimately covered all the bases, and uh, I learned from you as well. And I've been using Actions since the beginning. Thank you, Brian. This is, this is exciting. I love it. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you very much. So I think we're going to transition to our, our next speaker, uh, and our next speaker is Martins. Uh, Martins actually is a corporate sales representative here in uh, San Francisco, actually here with me, and. Uh, passionate about technology and um, loves helping engineers as well. So Martin, please take it away. All right, thank you. Thank you, Brian. <clears throat> like Brian mentioned, I'm a corporate uh, uh, account executive here in San Francisco Bay Area. And I'm also a Nigerian. Um, I recently uh, moved, I moved to the US about five years ago and I go back and forth all the time because I still have family over there. So, um, so I'm, Really excited to talk to you guys, talk to Africans all around the world, um, uh, specifically in Africa and in Nigeria. And I, I would also like to um, lend my voice to the ongoing protests in Nigeria. Um, I I was recently in Nigeria last um, this this year around February, and um, I did have some encounters with the police. So please stay safe over there and um, do your best to you know uh, maintain. Uh, peaceful protest as much as you can so so with that out of the way um i'd like to get into um what i'm of, or talking about uh today um i'll be talking about github actions um how we are uh, github are making actions and open source tools uh more accessible to developers all around the world and specifically in africa and um one of the background uh, one of the reasons why we are doing this is because we have a report that um, we call it the, uh, the the GitHub Octoverse report, and from the version of last year in 2019, we found that um, developers in Africa and Asia are making the most um, contributions to open source. And as you can see here, you can see. Um, uh, at least four African countries, Nigeria, Morocco, Tunisia, and Kenya, are making a lot of contributions uh, to open source. And they represent the, the fastest growing um, um, regions of uh, developers making contributions to open source. So, and this led to our CEO and our technical um, advisor, uh, Nat Friedmer and Omoju, uh, making a visit to Nigeria last year um, to you know see the top developers just the top um, open source contributors and to acknowledge their work and to um, um, look for ways to support them and that is why we are doing these meetups because we want to connect with our um, our family in in Africa and do all we can to support and um, make all of these tools that we are building at GitHub accessible to everyone, um, specifically Africa. So, um, so ov ov overall, that's that's the driver for um, my talk. I'll be talking about how you can introduce uh, GitHub to your uh, to your projects or to to your company if you if you're working for a company, and how you can you know start. And making and taking advantage of all of these um, tools that we are building out for for you guys. So uh, I know I'm wearing the exact exact same sweater. I was I was trying to trick you guys to make you believe uh, I'm always wearing this all the time. But I I, I decided to just uh, uh, wear the same sweater and uh, put the same picture here. But I don't sleep in this sweater. But uh, I love this sweater very much. So. Yeah, so I just turned this around, so it looks a little bit different from the picture. So I'll talk about I'll talk through GitHub Actions a little bit, GitHub Mobile, and GitHub Free, and how you can get uh, GitHub Enterprise Cloud for your for your startups or for your organization. 
Um, one of the one of the key reasons we build Guild of Action was like uh, Shodipo just uh, uh, went through is to really make sure that you can um, autom automate your workflows and have have a native experience, a native CI CD experience within GitHub, a continuous integration and delivery experience all within GitHub uh, without uh, changing context at all. And one of the things I would like to point out is that GitHub is platform agnostic. You can deploy to any cloud provider that you, you are comfortable with. Uh, GitHub um, Actions um, works with um, AWS works with Azure, Azure, uh, Azure, and Google Clouds. So, and most of these um, cloud providers have a startup program. So, if you if you if you're looking to get your startups off the ground, definitely check out their website for their startup programs and um, and and sign up for it. And with GitHub Actions um, plugged in, you can really get your your business off the ground or get your your startup um, off the ground. And I'll talk. To, I'll also talk through how you would be able to um, um, get uh, our flagship GitHub Enterprise Cloud for free for your startups. So, um, lastly, I would like to like uh, Shodik also mentioned. Um, GitHub Actions um, has a lot and um, a lot of applications and a lot of extensions on the marketplace. Um, there are over five thousand applications that have already been built that you can use for your projects. Um, and like he mentioned, make sure you you look for very high star ratings for the applications and also make sure that they are verified by GitHub. And you can always go to, the, to their repositories to figure out um, the code that builds the app and um, you know just get in there, test things out and um, you know have fun. So beyond GitHub Actions, I also like to talk through uh, GitHub Mobile Experience. We um, this this was launched. Um, we, we acquired some companies to have this launched um, last year, and and it became um, generally available this year. And the the reason we are building this out is to make sure that you can um, you know access your GitHub um, uh, pull request on the go. We understand um, from some analysis that uh, um, the mobile the, the the mobile platform mobile platform is very um, highly penetrated in in Africa. Over I know there was a stacks around um, saying over sixty percent of uh, the population in Africa use a, a, a smartphone. So you can um, walk on the go. I know for example there are um, lots of um, uh, long commute times in Lagos, Nigeria, for example. So while you were going 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 back home after after a long day, long day of work, you can you can still review pull request and quickly access your issues and keep tabs on on the projects uh, that you that you have going on. And um, I actually tried to confirm that Git, GitHub Mobile is is currently available in Africa. I I talked to um, a developer in Nigeria yesterday, and he was. He confirmed that um, GitHub Mobile is um, currently working in Nigeria. So please let me know if um, let me let us know in the chat if GitHub Mobile is, is um, live in your country. Mm -hmm. uh, it should be live, but just let me know uh, in in the comments below, and um, we would uh, take that feedback accordingly. Last uh, next, I would talk about how all of these tools that we're building, you can get it. Um, um, within um, the GitHub free um, tier, so you can use GitHub Actions on the on the on the free tier, and you can use a GitHub mobile app with the free tier. So um, around the background for this is we wanted to really reduce the barrier for all developers all around the world, including Africa, so that they can easily adopt GitHub and um, get started with their um, with, with their projects, um, one of the one of the feedback we, we kept getting from the community was that um, many developers um, uh, needed a, an easier way to just uh, get access to private repositories 
and then you know collaborate on private repositories and and eventually move that to the open source if they are developing for for the open source uh, community so we we came up with the github free tier plan and it allows you to get you know github actions get all the the basics of github of the github platform and you can you can uh, start from there and, and collaborate with your friend there is no limit to the number of um, collaborators you can have on this plan and you can you can get it today it's it's free for all of your uh, it's free for teams and it's free for uh, there is no limits to the number of collaborators you can have on the github free plan so and and lastly i, I want to talk through um the the github enterprise cloud um for startups program so we have we as, as you know we, we we are well supported by microsoft and there is a, a platform there, there is a program to get you our flagship github enterprise um a product for free um, as far as you, you you are a startup and you're looking to um, um, you know be more secure, have a, a better product overall to use for your company, and um, you can sign up for the GitHub uh, for for the Microsoft Startup uh, program, and you will get GitHub Enterprise Cloud, which is used by um, all sorts of organizations all around the world to. Uh, develop, collaborate, and and ship great products that you use. Um, so you can sign up for this program on 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 the Microsoft page. I would I will send some links after now in the chat for you to sign up for this. And the the cool thing is with this program, you you get all of the things um, on on the enterprise platform. This is just our landing page, and all all of the best enterprises in the world use this for um for the organizations to um, um collaborate and to get talent and um you know get the best of the platform uh totally so this is something you can get uh with github uh enterprise um cloud and it's it's powered by the, the microsoft for startups program so um so beyond beyond this um i also like to um Point, point out that this uh, th this program um, is for free. It's, it's available all around the world. It's available for every African country. So you just need to sign up for it. And um, you can also contact me if you need more information. You can contact me on LinkedIn. Um, I'm happy to um, help out um, with this um, uh, with, with this product. Another, another way to think about how to use this is that if you if you if you're working for a company or you're working for a startup and you guys are looking to you're looking to introduce um, the, the, the the GitHub platform um, you, you're looking to bring GitHub to work um, this is an easy way um, a cost effective way there is there is no cost to get started with a, with a platform with our flagship platform so that's one more thing to to think about. And that's about it. So all in all, we're building GitHub Actions, we're building GitHub Mobile, we're giving GitHub for free. And if that doesn't meet your basic needs, you can then um, sign up for the for the startups program, and that would get you the best of the platform uh, for free. So um, that's all I have to say. Um, Keep in mind that most of the cloud providers all have all have a startups program, so you can all you can always sign up for all of the all of the all of the platforms and then plug it all together uh, on on the GitHub platform and um, you know make 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 the your best uh, do your best work. So with that, I will say thank you for listening. Um, I'll pass it back to Brian so he can uh, uh, keep us going here. Yes, thanks, Martin. So pre appreciate the uh, the talk you've given. And um, yeah, we're gonna move right along uh, to our next speaker who I'm uh, super honored to have here as a, an, also a, a recent star. Um, Ruth is not just a recent star, but also self-taught Python programmer. Um, she's also a contributor to a GNOME project and uh, as well as uh, been involved with She Coach Africa, I had an opportunity to meet Ruth last week at an event we um, we both did, um, and uh, yeah, super excited to hear her content around contributing uh, to open source as a 
a new contributor. Hi everyone, welcome to GitHub Virtual and thanks for attending my talk. Thank you everyone for attending. Thank you to Nigerians for attending because at this point we are at a we are at the time where we are trying to protest against police brutality and thank you for really making our time to attend this talk and also thank you GitHub for hosting me on this event. Okay, back to me. I'm Ruth Ikega from Nigeria. I'm a Python developer, a technical writer, and an open source contributor. And one very good thing about me is I love eating cakes a lot and almost every time. So today I'm going to be talking about how to get involved as a beginner in open source. This, this topic actually resonates with me because I started off with open source as a beginner. So it's, it's really something I love talking about. And I also love getting beginners involved and telling them and letting them know that they can contribute to open source, even as beginners or code newbies. So let's go ahead. So um, when a project is open source, it means that anybody is free to use it, anybody is free to distribute, free to distribute for any purpose. You can contribute to the project. And that's basically what it means when um, a project is termed open source. Now, first off, I want to like start with um, debunking some beliefs, with, especially amongst beginners, with contributing with, to open source. Like most of, most of the reasons why um, they shy away so first off is they always like have we always have this um, notion that contributing to open source is about code. If you it's just code contributions you can make in open source, but that's not actually that that's not actually true because there there are other means and very vital ways you can contribute to an open source project without having to write code. So contributing to open source is not just about code contributions. Yeah. So um, the next thing I'll talk about is that your level of skill set, no matter what um, level you are, whether you're a beginner, a code newbie, intermediate developer, or a senior developer, your level of skill set in open source contributions is welcome. Uh, like Samsung, Gordy will always say quality over quantity welcome. So you should focus on the quality you're bringing to that project when contributing to an open source project. Now also, um, there's, the, there's the belief that um, or contributing to open source is just free work and there are no benefits to you as a person but that that's not actually true that's not that's not true entirely because there are amazing benefits with contributing to open source you get to improve your skill set you get to work with you get people's skills you there are like paid opportunities with working in open source in, in open source projects we have the internship opportunities like the google summer of code the google season of dogs outreachy and the rest of them and there are some people that have been paid that are paid to work on open source projects so there's there are a whole lot of amazing benefits with contributing to open source so another point i would like to point out that people um, especially designers i want to let you know that designers can also contribute to open source just like i pointed earlier that contributing to open source is not just about code but um, designers can also contribute to open source and one great way to contribute is the open source design team which um, Ariel Fox is actively handling. So I'm going to talk about that um, as we move forward. So how, how do you get involved? Like what, what um, how do you get involved? Since you know, like as a beginner, you can contribute to open source. How do you get involved? So um, we are in the month of October and um, this is the month of October 1st. So October 1st is an annual program um, where in the month of October, it's a month long contribution, open source contribution, where you are required to get um, four pull requests managed and you get a reward of a t-shirt or you get to plant a tree. So um, one way you can get involved in open source is you can utilize this month of October 1st to start contributing to open source because there are a whole lot of projects that are on GitHub that are engaging in the Hacktoberfest program. So you just, um, I, I'm going to share these slides later. So um, you just click on go to hacktoberfest.com and you register and start looking for projects on GitHub. And there are very useful resources and videos that would help you get started. 
Yeah, so um, next thing is um, finding open issues on GitHub to tackle on. So if you use the search query, you can use the search query on GitHub to find um, open issues. Um, you can even, GitHub has this feature where you get to search by label, you get to search for good first issues and first timer only issues. So once you put that, once you put that up, a search comes up and you see a good number of repositories with so many good open issues that you could start up on. So another, another way is um, uh, writing or contributing to project documentation. Like I mentioned earlier, it's not just about uh, code contributions, yeah? So um, you can you can uh, contribute to the project documentation, you can help improve the docs, you can help you can help with uh, in fixing out typos, no matter no matter how small the contribution is, it is valid as far as you're giving quality to that project, right? So uh, next up, um, you can help with planning and organizing events. So people think like this is not something, this is a valid contribution in open source, in open source projects. Because um, for projects, you, you need to actually, for you to um, have, um, for you to have good quality, you need to be able to organize the project well, or be the software. So you can help as um, a contributor in planning and organizing events. So good enough, there are so many virtual events that need hands-on to plan because but, you know, virtual events have, um, you need more like more planning um, for virtual events. So there are so many virtual events you could help organize, so many open source virtual events. So another way, another valid way to like get involved in contributing to open source is answering questions and reviewing code and helping out in the community. So most of the time when people hop into communities, it's usually very hard for them to find their way around. And for you who has been in the community, you can help them out, showing them their way around, answering questions, you can review code, um, code pull requests, you can do a whole lot in the community. So another point is uh, supporting an open source project or even open sourcing your project. So with the GitHub feature, sponsoring feature, you could support um, an open source project or you can open source. I see some people open source their portfolio or their projects they have built just to help others in the community because mainly open source is about the community. So um, I have accumulated uh, some useful resources um, that would help you get started with contributing to open source as a beginner. And these resources, for me, it has it has really been helpful because initially when I got when I uh, when I started with contributing to open source, it was really um, very helpful to me. Like a uh, first timers only. It's like a site where you can find. Um, a good number of open source projects that you can contribute to as a beginner, like a curated list of open source projects. Uh, you can use the GitHub Explore, Explore, um, can use the GitHub Explore to search for projects as by your stack. Let's say you're a Python developer or a, a JavaScript person, you can search for projects as per stack, topics, the ones that are trending. You can engage in open source and contribute to open source Friday. There's always, I think there's always like an event every Friday. You can check out code triage, 24 pull requests, um, up for grabs, a whole lot. And also first contributions, if you are very, especially for beginners, um, most of the time, I think one frustrating thing is understanding how to do the GitHub workflow, contributing, pushing your code, committing. So for first contributions, first contributions actually has um, it's it's a project to help beginners contribute to open source to understand that GitHub and Git workflow. So you might want to try that. I think that was the first that was the first contribution I made, just adding my name to the repository. It was really very cool. And I, I got to, I got to post it on Twitter and I was like, I made my first contribution today. And I was getting so many congratulations. It was so, so nice and good. So also um, open source design for designers. Um, you could get involved here, check out um, the website and check out the repositories on GitHub to get you involved with open source design. So uh, I want to end up this talk with saying um, you should make yourself um, that software you use and the world at large better by contributing to open source today. Uh, thank you for listening and you can connect to me via my social media handles, GitHub at this link and on Twitter at Kigarut. Thank you for listening. 
Thank you, Ruth. I appreciate that. And uh, folks, that was really insightful. And I, I, I love contributing open source. I love folks sharing their details and sharing how to also get you involved in doing open source. So if you're interested, definitely hang around, follow the meetup, uh, follow this YouTube channel as well. Uh, but we do have an, we have more talks. Uh, we're not ending. Um, so our next speaker is Shedrack. Um, not only is Shedrack uh, doing this talk, uh, he's also doing two other talks today. Because uh, I know yeah. I spoke at All Things <laughs> Open yesterday, and you're speaking to All Things Open today. Um, so yeah, yeah, thanks for taking time out of your day. Um, honored yeah, to yeah. have you here. I've, I've seen you around uh, in the JavaScript space as well. So happy to learn from you and learn um, about documentation around open source projects. So Shedrack, you want to take it away? Yeah, sure, sure. Um, so let me share my my screen real quick. Um, okay. Okay. Um, perfect. Um, hi everybody. My name is Shadrach Kakintayo, and today I'm going to be talking about documenting your open source project. Um, this is the first time I'm giving this talk anyway, so I'm quite excited about it. So, I'm um, about me. I'm a developer advocate at Cloud Foundry Foundation, and we're an open source platform. I'm a tech writer for um, Smarty Magazine and Log Market. Also, an open source community be there with um, open source Africa, community Africa. So, let's just what are we going to discuss today? We're going to talk about what's the documentation, just the basics of everything, importance of documentation in open source, um, tips for writing effective docs, traits of successful OSS docs, then tools for writing good open source documentation. Then, just give a simple portable structure for your open source documentation. Then, finally, we're just going to see. Um, quick, quickly just see some examples of good open source documentation. So before we begin, this is something I always encourage people to do. Read the docs, read them. They are very, very important for you. And they're very, very important for um, for you to understand the software. So the um, maintainers know why they write docs. So instead of asking questions on Stack Overflow, do you know that you could actually read the docs and um, get your questions answered? So please read the docs. Thank you. So let's get started. So what is documentation? So I mean, we're looking at documentation specifically in programming in open source. So documentation in programming design is basically any text, illustration, or media that gives detailed information about a particular software. So this information could be anything. It could be from how to use the software, how the um, software op operates. It could be a roadmap for how the software should um, be, um, evolve. So, basically, um, so documentation is basically anything, written text or media, that basically tells us about, um, if give us information about a particular software. Um, so forms of documentation, I mean, a lot of us really just think documentation stops at just written text. I mean, just seeing the readme.md file and that's documentation, or just seeing a hosted version of the readme.md file. So documentation um, is way more than that, right? So um, we have written text, like like the most popular form of documentation is readme. Then we also have release notes. So release notes contains like um, the um, release candidates and every single thing about that particular release. So that could also serve as documentation for that particular software. Um, we have illustration. So illustration could for um, an, a, um, an open source project would include the roadmap, how the um, the maintainers envision the um, software to grow, how the um, the uh, what the maintainers are planning for the software in the future time. Also, illustration could also include graph. So basically, um, graph of um, maybe a benchmark test or etc. for their particular open source software. So if you look at testing JavaScript build tools. You would see various different graphs comparing various JavaScript view to view tools and your speed, etc. So we also have videos. I mean, you can have various um, forms of um, tutorial videos concerning particular um, particular software. So that can also serve as documentation. This is audio. It's not so popular, but we also have um, audio um, forms of documentation. Then comments in code, which is pretty, this is pretty popular among developers. So um, when we um, put certain comments about um, a particular code but block that could also serve as documentation for that particular software or that particular code. Um, so, um, importance of documentation in OSS. So, I mean, the open source is like a very, very open source software is, very, is like quite popular. I mean, this, like, a lot of people are using it, a lot of people are actually doing um, open source. So, I mean, what, what is the importance of documenting your open source project? I mean, it's based number first, the first thing I would say is to help educate people and keep track on all of the software. So, the reason why people would want to use your uh, open source software is because they know how to use it. So that is this is where documentation comes in. You have to educate people on how to use your particular software. And also, like I said, 
uh, with these nodes, with these nodes can serve as a, pro um, a, um, a form of um, tracking all um, aspects of the software, like setting development in the software. So that's one of the importance of documentation in open source. Um, it improves the quality of the software. I mean, every good software has great documentation. No matter how good a particular software is, a particular open source project is, if the documentation is not great, a lot of people will use it. It could it could be it could be it could do many things. It could compress an image from its one gig image to one MB. But if the documentation does not tell people how to do this particular thing, it would not use it. so it would have great software but um horrible documentation and in general horrible software because the documentation actually makes software. So it informs people on all changes made on the software, including version of this. Like I said, um release notes, release notes basically tell people um if you check the GitHub, so for those don't know who don't know where um where these notes are, if you check your GitHub um if at the GitHub page of a particular project, you would if you check the click on releases, you would see um various um releases batches. So if you click on it, every single one of them, most of them comes with release notes. So release notes basically tell us what updates were made, what updates were churned, what particular features of a particular open source were churned, were churned or removed. So it informs people on what aspect of the software is currently being worked on the maintainers, on by the maintainers of the um, OSS project. Like I said, with the roadmaps. The roadmaps are very important because people want to know what next. Like after we have this particular feature, what's next for us? So it's good for you as the OSS maintainer to have a roadmap for your particular project. It doesn't necessarily have to be something big. It doesn't necessarily have to be something large. It could just be what you think, what you, um features that you think should come in for the particular software. So roadmaps are always really good to have. So tips for writing effective open source documentation. So, I mean, I have an open source software now. So how do I write a documentation that increases the quality of my software, of, increases the quality of the project? So now the first thing you would do, like, I mean, this is not even just in documentation. In writing as a, as a general, the first thing you would do is to define a style guide, guide for your documentation and enforce it. I would say you should be strict with your style guide because style guide gives you a vision for how you envision your um open source documentation to look like so defining a style guide for your documentation and enforcing it is very important you can find various open source documentation or documentation style guides on the internet um you can also check right the docs right the docs have very great um style guide for you to follow um so pick up a markup style and stick with it i mean it's very very important for you to pick up a particular markup style and enforce it all through your documentation consistency will make people feel comfortable that Okay, this particular person really knows what he or she or they are uh, um, doing. So, um, focus on using an active voice. Very important. I mean, people using your software, people using your open source project are, 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 are humans, are humans, right? So, you need to be, um, you need to maybe create a conversational tone. So, use you, use us, use we, um, passive voices where you feel like, um, you're just talking to the person. Make it a collaborative effort. We, so we is very important when you're writing um, um, your um, open source documentation. So make it of simple and short um, sentences. This will encourage efficient communication. So a lot of people do not want to read a long um, sentence. Just look, try your best to make use of simple sentences. And instead of writing two lines, look for a way to write a single line. This is very important because people get bored. So the attention span of people gets really short as they grow older. So you would try your best to make sure that um, sentences are simple and short. I get bored myself when I write, when I read um, long documentation. So um, if you, um, when I see documentation that uses very simple and short sentences to um, pass a particular message across, I always prefer to read it. So make sure to format your documentation properly for easy reading. This is very important because people need to know where things are. Very important. I know I, I cannot be looking for where um, um, authentication is. Just put a sidebar that shows every single thing um from um from how your um documentation is styled etc because people need to know where things are so that it, it reduces the development time for them whenever they are using your um open source documentation and when it's open source design people need to know where particular styling are so for open source people that uh, for designers designers that um, be, um do open source so they create style guides for particular open source software so if these things are documented properly people spend less time on documentation and more time using stuff or using your particular software. So that's also very important. Include code, sample code and example. I mean, if you are building the software, you need to show people that this is what you can do. This is an example of how to use it. 
Like, like I said, even though I will give an example, uh, a use a meme for people to read the documentation. Most people do not read documentation. Sometimes I myself, I find myself busy of not reading documentation. I just go straight to the code samples that are available or the examples and just read it and see, oh, this is how I'm supposed to use this thing. I do not read the complete documentation. So for for we have to make provision for those people that those people like me and many other people that do not read the documentation and um. So you can just see these code samples and examples that are available for us to use immediately. So use visual devices to represent information. So most of the time, like I said, the attention span of people goes very low as they grow older. So you need to be able to um, be accommodative for every single type of person. So a lot of people prefer to see visual things than to actually read sentences. So one thing you can do is add illustrations, tables, graphs of certain concepts in your documentation so that you can be more inclusive for every type of person. And there's also people that find it very difficult to read stuff. So I mean you need to you need to be um you need to be inclusive in when you're writing a particular documentation that you expect a lot of people to use, that you expect people in general to use. So one also important thing is tell check your documentation to avoid errors. There are a lot of documentation that I've seen felt failing errors that have made me confused. So you need to you do not want your users, people that will use your um, open source project to be confused on how to use a particular thing or, or confused in reading um in using your your open source software. So you should always check your spell check your documentation to avoid errors. This is very, very important. Um provide contribution guidelines. So I mean why we are talking why we are specifically talking about um open source documentation. Another very important thing to do is to provide um, contribution guidelines because if you provide a guideline for how people should contribute to your project, you would definitely see less error on contributing. So um, providing um, guidelines is also a very good, important um, example of um, um, writing effective OSS documentation. So the traits of um, so, um, successful OSS docs, so this is like from my experience of what I've seen in um, open source documentation. The very first thing is easy access to information regarding core aspects of the software. Like I said, most of these um, well built out documentation have a sidebar of um, things that um, show where you can find certain information about your a particular, about the particular software. So, um, well, so one of the things is well a well structured. So if if your documentation is well structured, it will allow people to have access to information. Like I said, very fast. So you do not want people to spend more time reading documentation. We need to make people spend less time doing documentation and more time building with our software. Very important. Now, help new developers learn to use OSS, um, to use your OSS software, your open source software quickly. This is very important. We, like I said, we do not need people to spend more time reading documentation. We need more people, people to spend less time grab certain concepts about our open source software and using our software immediately. So when our, we have a very great open source door, people, uh, people quickly the information they need to get and they can easily grab um, whatever they need and go and start building. So simplify the usage of your open source documentation. I mean, a lot of people like to use grammar in, a lot, a lot of grammar in their um, open source documentation. So one very important thing that you can do, you can do is to make it easy for people to read your documentation and use it. So another thing is to cost the amount of time users, um, users of your open source documentation need support. One thing is, Every good open source documentation reduces the amount of time people spend looking for support. People spend checking um 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 stack overflow. So when people have access to um great information on your open source documentation, whenever they have issues, they check. They see okay, the documentation already explains how to use this particular thing. Then they would not need to go to other platforms to start searching for um open source for for um some um solutions to using your particular software. So that's also very important. So some tools for writing good um, open source documentation. Docker Soros. So Docker Soros makes it very easy for um, people to maintain open source documentation software. It is built by Facebook and is currently um, so and currently um, created by um, currently maintained by Facebook and is also an open source project. So Docker Soros basically gives or generate um, a website for hosting our open source documentation. So Sphinx is also a very good one. It's called a documentation generator. And it basically takes a bunch of source files in plain text, so it's very easy. Then generates a bunch of other um, awesome things, mainly HTML. So it basically takes a bunch of your source file, very easy to use, then creates HTML directly from it. So one other, I mean, the most popular form of writing your documentation is 
GitHub using G your GitHub README or and create using a GitHub pages to um, create I mean, a website for it. So to use GitHub for documenting your software, all you just need to do is to fill in the README in Markdown, very easy to use. And if you want more than just one sheet of um, formatted text, you can take advantage of GitHub pages too. And you can even route to a custom domain. It's also very, very uh, easy to use. Um, I think it's one of the most popular form of um, writing um, documentation, hosting documentation. Also, read the doc. So, read the doc simplifies software documentation by automating, building, and hosting um, version of your docs. So, read the docs is also very, very um, easy for you to use. Um, so, it's also very easy for you to use. Sorry. Um, possible structure for your um, documentation. The first thing you could do is, um, pardon the interruption. The first thing you could do is getting started. So a possible structure for your open source documentation is um, you need to create a getting started highlight, um, then also the architectural design in production. Then when you, when you have the architectural design for your software, it makes people to understand, like I said, visual devices, makes people understand how to how um, the thought process for you of how you build um, your particular software is there. Then in production usage guide, also very um, uh, important. A lot of people use this software that we make in production, not just development. So um, there are certain processes, there are certain ways people, um, in certain ways people um, use a particular software in development and in um, development uh, and in production. So um, you need to create a guide for how people can use it in production. Because at the end of the day, we actually want to build production grade software. So use cases. I mean, we have you have a software, right? So how can people use it for various reasons? So uh, a use cases can also surface in as a section in your documentation. The reference is where did you pick certain things from your software? Um, where did you pick certain links to um, certain software? I mean, we, at the end of the day, we need we lift code from certain different places to actually make software. So referencing those particular code that we've used is also very important. Then the roadmap. So the roadmap gives your um, users, people that will actually use your open source software, um a guide on what is coming what new features are coming what do you envision for the particular project it's also um very uh, so this is right here is just a basic structure of how i envision um a, doc a great documentation would look like so some example of um good open source documentation the gatsby documentation is really really great um you spend less time using reading documentation and more time building and the react js docs talk about most concepts that you actually need to um, understand how to use React. The Vue.js job is one of the most perfect documentation I've seen. With the release of Vue 3, I checked the latest documentation. It was like really, really awesome. Um, great job to the entire Vue team for a particular one. Then the Chakra UI doc. Chakra UI is the um, React um, library built here in Nigeria. Um, the docs is also very, very easy to use and um, very helps um, developers get started immediately with um, this, um, with their um, with Chakra UI. So the GitHub Open API docs, I mean, most of us, <laughs> would not lie, most of us have used GitHub API for certain reasons. And all the last time I used GitHub API for a particular project, it was really, really easy to get started with. Um, everything is there, every single thing you need is there. The API is properly documented. There's an open, uh, then um, cl um, Cloud Foundry docs. So Cloud Foundry is that, like, like the, um, the company I work at, the open source um, project. Um, it's, um, it's one of the best um, past, platform that provides um, developer experience on Kubernetes. So um, the documentation is really, really easy and very easy for people to get started with. Then Bootstrap, a lot of us use Bootstrap and Bootstrap is an open source software. So Bootstrap gets, um, makes it easy for you to build um, accessible UIs and also create UIs very, very easily. The docs are wonderful. So you basically do not need um, any tutorial, any extra tutorial to be able to use um, this, um, all of the docs that I've mentioned here. So, this is something from Cathy Sierra. She's um, the creator of the Headfest Head um, Head series. Um, she currently has left the tech space because of cases of sexual harassment, um, harassment, et cetera. But she said something on the platform. She said, if you read the um, manual, then make a better uh, manual. So, I mean, if you want people to actually read your documentation, you need to make a better documentation so people can spend less time searching for answers on how to use your software in other places and spend more time building with actually with your software. So references and resources. So this here right here are a couple of um, references and um, resources that I feel like everybody here that has read this talk should read and spend their time reading. 
So most of it is from Google, um, the open source.com um, blog and some from the um, Google um, open source blog, then a particular um, gist from Arbo and I was talking about the part this, um, this particular, that gives a breakdown of what Cartesiera means in this particular um, um, image. So thank you everybody for coming to my talk. Once again, thank you for the interruption. Um, how to connect with me? You can connect with me on Twitter at Koda underscore Black. You can check me out on GitHub at Activist123. And if you want to send an email to me on for any partnership or so, or just, just to reach out and say thank you, you can reach out to me at akintarashidak at gmail.com. 100% documented. It really feels good. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming to my talk once again. And lastly, I would like to draw the attention of the, Af of the entire world from what happened in Africa. Um, with Africa here is bleeding in Nigeria are facing cases of um, police brutality, and in Namibia we are also facing cases of killing. Same thing with Congo, and um, Africa is currently bleeding. So I would like everybody to um, be kind to what um, is going on here in Africa. We try to create awareness and educate yourself more on what's happening in Africa because without Africa, at the end of the day, there's no such thing as um, the virtual meet of Africa. So. Thank you so much, everybody, once again, for coming to my talk. Excellent. Thanks, Shedrack. Yeah, that was great content. And uh, yeah, it was um, a lot of great examples at the end, too, as well, for folks who want to get involved in documentation and set up their documentation properly. Uh, definitely check out that. And um, follow Shedrack on Twitter, too, as well. You'll probably share your slides if you haven't done already. Yeah, I have. I have said it to Erin. Excellent. All right, so we're going to transition to our final speaker uh, for the event, which is Ikram. Ikram's a uh, front-end developer, uh, and they are going to talk us about the, the roadmap for for becoming a front-end front developer. So, yeah, looking forward to it. Hello, Hello everybody. Hello, everybody. I'm Ikram Babsawal. So thank you for coming to watch me talk. Thank you for coming to the GitHub Africa meetup. I, I really appreciate it. Really appreciate it. So um, I'm going to share my slide right now. And okay. So um, if you can hear me, please. If you can see the screen, can I know, please? Okay. So let a little introduction about myself. I'm Ikram Bapsawa. In front of the web platform. So this is what we'll cover. We'll cover what is web development, what is front-end development, why you should learn front-end development, why front-end development is better than back-end and full stack. What do I what do you need to be a front-end developer? Learn front-end development in these few steps. Learn resources, what you're free to do, add. Bye bye. So what's web development? According to Google, web development is the work involved in developing a website for the internet or intranet. Web development can range from developing a simple sing single starting page of plain text to complex web-based internet application, electronic business, and social network services. Let me put it in simple terms. Web development is using a bunch of code and languages to make a web page. So you make a web page, let me just make a web page. It like if well, if I assume you're doing you're doing a website for you, you're a front freelance developer, or, or you're working for a company right now. So when you're doing um, when you want to build a website for them, or maybe for okay, let's use freelance for your client. You have to know what thing. the website you're making should also promote their business. I don't say the use of a website when you can't promote your business, you can't help you grow your business. So you. When you make it with the bunch of code, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, view, drop everything together, like you're cooking stew, maybe you're cooking a soup, maybe you're cooking a soup, or jello fries, it has to do something. One main purpose is that you should promote you. So we have three sections of web development or types. We have the front end, back end, full stack, but we're only going to focus on front end developer today. So the front end developer, I like to call it front-end engineer or the web developer or designer. 
The further de web development is a practice of converting to a converting data to a graphical interface through the use of HTML, CSS, JavaScript, so the user can view and interact with that data. It's like it's converting a, a design to an interactive website. Like design a picture of a food to the main food that you're going to eat right here for that you're going to dig into it. That's what it is. Very simple. It's just converting a design or a graphical interface to a an interactive website through the use of HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and other. As a front of developer, you should have some certain skills. HTML, CSS, JavaScript, React, Viewer. Oh, there's a type area here. Sorry, it's not view, it's a view. V U E or any other JavaScript framework. You can use Bootstrap or any other CSS framework. So this framework will make your work easier. Like if I say Bootstrap, sometimes it says it's the responsive design is always stressful. Well, and other than that. But you need to like Bootstrap, SAL, S A S S, S C S S, Booba, until I make it easier. Same with JavaScript. So things like that. But the, you can actually make a a website that can blow someone away without HTML and CSS. I've done that a lot, and it's been the best thing I've ever done. That what I'm currently using for my new website. But adding JavaScript make it more extraordinary because it gives more functional functionality. So let's go to the next side. So why should I? Why should you learn this front end developer? Like I would want to learn something without knowing why should I learn it? Like do we have a user life? Will it improve my life? So, front end web developer, I demand as much as other um, section back end developer, where uh, full stack, mobile, they are all in demand. But I, me personally, I think according to Google, front end web developers are very in demand than the others. So, you can work as a self employed freelancer, you can work for an organization, anything. And it is also a lucrative career. Uh, I'll call you to Google again. Google is my best friend as a developer, so. Front end web developer pays well. All that stuff pays well, but. Front end web developer pays extra well. I'll call you to Google. Front end web developer with three years of experience, that's a junior developer, can earn from $48,000 to $78,000 thousand dollar per year not per month I, per month i'm not sure right? so flexibility as a front-end developer you can work from anywhere so with other developer but from what i add and what i research most people that work from home are front-end developers or, or full-start developers you can work from anywhere including oh this is one of the most flexible careers Coding in general is very flexible the skill set you acquire allow you to work in different areas like image Editing UX UI, boy, well, okay, that's what we right there, but I forgot to remove it. I was trying something out. So, things like that, it works with design, everything. So, this brings us to creativity. Front end web driven is all about creativity, create, create problem solving. As a front end web developer, you have the skill to be customized website to create the best possible user interface. Uh, I don't want to say just a little tip. As a front-end developer, please be good with user experience. Like I don't say I don't say user interface, like user experience. So you know how the user interacts with it. So maybe this website is to say you should come to our our uh, cat store and don't let the message be on the website is that you should just visit our website or just see cat or online or any other you different message the message should be come and buy a pet or have a play date with our pets so and also be creative maybe maybe okay the client wants you to fill in text for them you can bring up text niche different thing even is it really good at the front end developer you should have basic designing skills so maybe you want to add an image but you want it to match with the height um Elegancy, so you have to design some things to make it elegant. Well, 
Cody has a very career opportunity. So this one is for Cody in general. Many career opportunity. Um, you can work by yourself, work for a company, um, be an employee freelancer. Like if, what I mean is that um, you give services to a certain company every time. Like you're working there, but you're not working there. You're a freelancer. So is that you have a contract with them that you know if they want a more services from you, they can cut it to you and they'll pay. And again, all right, for instance. So it is really good. And with coding, front of the back of the web development, you can create a successful career that, will, that you'll be happy with. I love that tip. I yeah, I'll keep coming tip in between. Please, if you're not enjoying working at a workplace, maybe you're having a problem with it, or the boss, the boss that grades you, it doesn't like, it doesn't motivate you. It, it, like the company itself is just bad. You cannot cope with it. It's not. It's not like to enjoy your work. They take control of my of your side project. Please leave. Don't continue leaving that. And I call it them. And it's a constantly evolving field. Now let me use JavaScript as an example. JavaScript keep bringing framework from here, there, every time. Like when did I think next JS just came out? I think this year, or was it Docs JS? One of them. They came out this year. You can never get bored in this career. You are, it's always evolving, changing with more skills, and you get to interrupt with new skills, learning skills. It will keep you very engaged. You can never get bored of web development, except you stick to one language. You usually get bored. I'm sorry, but you usually get bored. It's actually provide a lot of opportunity it can add your creativity um it's very i don't know how to say the word but creativity is the best so front -end developer is the best so this is the rush the picture i don't have a good picture quality but this is kind of a roadmap to uh, front -end developer the or everything you have to know what the front end developer so so you want to get the image please go to roadmap dot sh i will road okay so um like road i'm oh, sorry for writing it down road map dot s h sorry my address is not good on the screen so roadmap dot sh so I'm going to close SH. So now let's go to the next side. Why is front end better than back end and front stack? That's the I'm just saying it. I know when I said it, some people are actually think that why will they um why will the one section be better than the other section? I can't say that it's better, but all of them are good, they are the same, they are yeah, have their own property, they don't want the same way. I love a full stack. Uh, full stack. It works with front end, front end and back end. Actually, deal with both of them. So I will call you the magic, the magician, the brain. <laughs> so, but none is better. None is better. All of them are different. All of them are the same. They have the same level. You can also say, because I'm back end developer, I'm better than you. I'm better than you are the front end, because you're a front end developer. Or because I'm a full stack developer, better than front end and back end developer. No. All of you, the same, don't agree with anyone. Even if you know you're better, please don't say that. It might actually make some people give it. Peace. I give up. So differences between front-end and back-end. Front-end development, front -end developer work on what the user can see. Back-end building a infrastructure that supports it. The term front-end refers to the user interface, the interaction, everything. But the term back-end means the server, application, and database. That's the simple and major Difference I can give you. So, what do you need as a front end developer? You need determination, willingness to learn, willingness to ask questions. You're ready to push yourself to do more code, code, code. You're ready to do more projects. And you also have um, something you can use to bring you a phone. You don't, need, you don't necessarily need a laptop to call, but it's just more convenient than a phone. So, you can use a mobile phone to call as well. But the main thing is that you will be passionate and determined. 
So pretty to try out at the beginner. Oh, you can build a personal site using HTML CSS. You can use JavaScript to build a quiz game. You can use Bootstrap to create a landing page. You can use HTML, CSS, JavaScript, Bootstrap. All the Join together to create a photography website. You guys, uh, when if you said read docs, yeah, read the documentation. You can also watch a project online, but read the documentation. It actually yeah. take notes. Maybe the necessary things you need to just take it out. Ah, uh, okay. So let us say I'm not really good at this. No matter why I do it. Put concept into practice. When you learn something, put it into practice first so it can stick to this brain. To your best part of the brain. It's going the one that will help you in everything. So put the concept into practice so it can stick to here. So make projects. Continue making projects. Like Danny Thompson says, always be building. Always be building. Code, code, code. Refactor your code, like make improve it, um, remove the bugs and all the things. I show your projects to others so they can criticize. So, like, so I'll say what is wrong? Maybe it's the way the is a, maybe it's all responsive enough and all those things. And I got this from um Pratam, Pratam on Twitter. Is some is a CSS app developer. I will call it, it's also a front end developer, but it don't most CSS, you also create Twitter either. Also, you are free to doubt, you are free to think, you are free to communicate, you are free to ask questions, you are free to make mistakes, you are free to learn from your mistake, you are free to Google, and most importantly, you are free to have fun in learning. Always have fun while learning. Don't forget to Google. Google is a developer best friend. So you can learn. So what can I learn? Um, so for you can learn from Fit Coca, but that will deal with full stack development. You can learn from Code Academy. You can learn from JavaScript 30.com. You, you can, uh, front end method.io only is something that puts your test, your skills to test. You can learn from test automation.applitool.com. You can learn from Coursera. You can learn from CAD Academy. You can learn from SoloLearn. You can learn from the Audi project. All these websites they are great. I would love to share more, but. I don't want to say. So, do you do more resources? You can check out Daddy Marco, Daddy Marco, um, me tweet like his speed tweet. You can check his speed tweet. Um, that is a speed tweet. His speed tweet is a lot of resources. So, this is the link. Um, they want to start us the big one. So, Thank you and bye. So if you love technology, if you enjoy creating a great user experience and are looking for and are looking for an exciting career with a lot of growth potential, front up point for it might just be the best career for you. So thank you and I really appreciate it. If you have any questions, you might trip. I don't know if that's that, but thank you. Um goodbye. Excellent. Yeah, thank you very much for your talk. Um, folks, hope you enjoyed this event as well. Um, and understanding the the pathway into front-end development. Your portfolio is excellent, too. I did check out your website as well. Um, so, yeah, thank you for taking the time. Yeah. And so, yeah, we were... Oh, sorry. I didn't know. Yeah, yeah, it was uh, it, it cut in and out a little bit. But, yeah, uh, we got the we got the message, though. Excellent. So uh, oh, I'm going to wind this okay, down. Yeah, sorry, I'm not really good. I just Okay, excellent. Well, folks, thanks for joining us for the, the uh, GitHub Africa meetup. Uh, I just want to mention that we do have a, a meetup page. Um, so if you are interested in finding out when the next uh, meetup will be next month, uh, definitely check out the meetup page. I think we could drop the link somewhere in the chat. Um, uh, are you going to meet dot com and search for GitHub Africa too as well? Uh, trust me, it will be the only one that comes up. Um,
but yeah, so we have this event. Uh, it's going to be happening monthly. Uh, I wanted this shout out if anybody's interested in joining us uh, in the future. If you are looking to speak as well, we're looking for, always looking for great speakers and, and great content. So definitely leverage this, this platform for showcasing your skill and your talent and what you're doing uh, in Africa. Uh, and we appreciate to, to hear from you. So uh, tell your friends, tell your family. Uh, also tell your friends and family about GitHub Universe. GitHub Uni Universe will be a, a free event this uh, December. And uh, it's going to be focused around talking about the things we're shipping at, at GitHub. Uh, we've been shipping a lot, um, a lot of new features. We'll be shipping a lot of new features this uh, December as well. So uh, make sure you RCP and register for the event uh, and say hello. We'll have a lot of opportunity for the community to join together and collaborate on different things. Um, so with that being said, uh, appreciate all you. And um, yeah, thank you. <laughs>